Our modern lesson is from our life group study book, More Than Words, Ten Values for the Modern Family by Aaron Wathen. Hear these words. All it took was that simple question, are you boys or are you girls? Because in our world, the worst thing you can call someone is a girl. It is the most profound insult you can sling at the male of the species, regardless of their age or stature. Even a four-year-old boy picks up on the implied undesirable nature of being perceived as feminine. That aversion sticks through adolescent years and affects not only the ways that boys interact with women, but also how they see themselves and how they react to other boys who may be perceived as less manly for whatever reason. These acts of disparaging of the feminine, in the broad sense, lay the foundations of many social ills, including sexual harassment, homophobia, and bullying. May God bless the hearing of these new words. Amen. scripture lesson is from the first chapter of Genesis, the inclusive Bible version. Hear these words. And then God said, let us make humankind in our image to be like us. Let them be stewards of the fish in the sea, the birds of the air, the cattle, the wild animals, and everything that crawls on the ground. Humankind was created as God's reflection in the divine image God created them, female and male, God made them. God blessed them, and God said, Bear fruit, increase your numbers, and fill the earth, and be responsible for it. Watch over the fish of the sea, the birds of the air, and all the living things on the earth. My friends, this is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen.
invite you to be seated. And if we would be courageous enough and perhaps even dangerous enough to open our hearts and our minds to the power of God's love and the power of God's word. Let us pray together. Beloved and Holy One, you who creates each of us in your divine image, we are grateful this day for who we are. We are grateful for we are a divine reflection of you. So help us to know that. Help us to live more fully into that authenticity and experience. Help us to know that you called us by our very names and that we are yours. It is with that that we come now to hear, to receive, to respond to that which your Holy Spirit reveals to us. And in that revelation, may we be transformed in the twinkling of an eye that we may become more Christ-like in all of our ways. Bless us in the hearing of your word that we might then bless others. And so now, God, I pray that you would touch my lips of clay, mold them into the words that need to be spoken this day. And may the words that come from my mouth and the meditations on each and every one of our hearts, may they be ever acceptable to you. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. So for those of you who were present last Sunday, you would have heard a great word from the Reverend Jeremy Rose, who shared with us about authenticity. And don't worry, I've not got a couple of videos and I'm not going to sing a song today. <laughs> that may be an inside joke for those of you who were here, but Reverend Jeremy spent some time in his sermon last week talking about the authenticity of our experience, the authenticity of our lives, and how that authenticity lives out and is valued. And he became very vulnerable and shared some intimate pieces of his life in an attempt to understand that we are in this together, that we are one in Christ Jesus. Over these last few weeks together, we have been thinking about these values of Jesus, the values that teach us in our faith, the values that call us to be more Christ-like, the values that surround us. And those values are the things that draw us into the likeness of Christ. Jesus' whole preaching is around values. If you look at the Sermon on the Mount, which we would say is Jesus' thesis to the church, blessed are those who are hunger and thirst for righteousness, for theirs is the new realm of heaven. He teaches us to always look on the side of the poor, the disenfranchised, those who are often left behind. And in Jesus' time and in our time, we too must always draw close to the margins of the world. It is in this value that we share together this day to understand that we have been created in God's image, divine image, that that divine image of God lives inside each and every one of us. And that that divine image comes in all shapes and sizes, in all colors and creeds, in all genders and gender identities. In the utopia of who we are as human beings, God created us right at the very beginning. And the great news about that divine image, that divine spark, is that when we see one another, we are called to see the presence of God in us. That there is a presence that lives within you and me. It's why we say it is the Christ in us that greets the Christ in one another. For it challenges us to see beyond all of the labels and all of the things that we attribute to ourselves. So that we might go to that place of Christ. The place that lives within us. The soul perhaps. That we are called and challenged to go beyond those labels, to go beyond all of the gender binaries and experiences of our world so that we might see ourselves as God created us. There's a blessing of the values that we live into here at Cathedral of Hope. And over these last few weeks, we have been sharing those values together. Love and compassion, justice finding our way through the mire of the world and the way in which it sees itself to the ways in which Jesus sees us. And as we see ourselves, so we are then able to maneuver ourselves in this world through the values of our faith. 
I've said over and over again from this pulpit, perhaps not said enough and continues to be said, that Christianity is not so much a religion as it is a lifestyle choice. It is the values of Jesus' life, the values of faith that drive us to be the, the very best that we can be, to be the people of God. And today we land at the last of this sermon series to see that we are created in God's image. And that as people of God, we are called to strive for equality. Now, hear me, here at Cathedral of Hope, United Church of Christ, we have often seen equality as equal rights within the law to ensure that all people have access to the facilities, to the needs of one another. But today we take a little bend on that sense of equality to understand that equality is also something that we must strive towards for both women and men. To understand that in a world in which we live so often men are seen as superior to women. And that often that drives much of our systems, much of our rules, much of our regulations and has certainly driven many of us in the life of the church. It was only this year that the Southern Baptist Convention of the United States made and affirmed its belief that only men can serve as pastors. You might think this is something that happened a long time ago, but this year they reaffirmed that decision. And we know that there were many women who were serving in Southern Baptist congregations who were quote-unquote defrocked of their titles. Or they had to leave the denomination, or they were ousted by their denomination. And for many of us who have come from perhaps a more Roman Catholic background, we know that for quite some time, only men have been able to serve in the role of priest. To say that misogyny or the attributes of masculinity don't drive the culture in which we live and indeed the church would be to ignore these simple facts of life. And there are many of us, I'm convinced, myself included, who have been driven by this sense of masculine authority that we hear in the words of Aaron from the book this day, are you boys or are you girls? This in its context is a, a, a reference to the ways in which so often as younger people we are taught what is masculine and what is feminine. And for those of us in this room, I'm sure that we have been accused on either side of that fence that has driven who we have become. So often we fail to see that God is neither masculine or feminine, that God is neither male nor female, and yet many of us grew up in a system that believes that God is male. Indeed, so much of our Christian language directs us to the belief that God is male. And here at Cathedral of Hope United Church of Christ, we have taken seriously one of the values of our faith, that God calls us into equality women and men, that no matter who we identify as on this journey or in this space, we affirm that women have equality within this church and within its structure and within its values because we believe that's what Jesus directs us to. Now I realize that I'm a man, but that's how I self-identify today. I realize that that is my energy, but that has not always been my energy. As a young kid, can I get vulnerable with you for just for a few moments this morning? Sure. Thank you. <laughs> Some would say it's easier to get forgiveness than permission, but I will take it this morning. But I remember as a kid, I'm one of seven. All of my older siblings, I have one sister, and five brothers. I'm right at the very end. Well, that's technically not true. I'm one of an identical twin. My twin brother was born 10 minutes after me. But when I traveled across to the United States and through the time zones, he's now five hours and 50 minutes younger than I am. <laughs> and so I 
remind him of that every single birthday when I call him to wish him, my older brother, happy birthday because we've not yet got through the time zones. But I remember as a kid, I was called one of those troubled kids, a troublemaker, and not in the good way. I was a rebellious child. And I've come to learn over the years that part of that rebellion was my searching for my identity. But as a young kid, my mom had decided that she could no longer handle me. And so I was put into a children's home for a period of time. That may come as a surprise to you. It's not something I share very often, but I want to tell you that because I understood when I went into a children's home that I was displaying many what many people would call feminine attributes. So much so that I was bullied. I remember vividly in the children's home, one of the older kids who would take a towel first thing in the morning and make it sogging wet and then come in and flick me with it as a punishment for me being feminine. I remember vividly so many of those stories in my youth and in my growing up times that I began to withdraw into myself. And as I began to withdraw into myself, I tried to find ways in which I could give myself permission to be me. And I took up knitting and crochet. <laughs> I mean, seriously. If I was really trying to be anything else, I should have done football or soccer. But no, this little kid took up to crochet and knitting. I want to tell you that made things worse. But I do remember that the very thing, the first thing that I knitted was this beautiful scarf. But it was in all the rainbow colors. <laughs> you think I would learn? And as I took up crocheting, I remember crocheting this beautiful blanket that I gave to my grandmother. And it was also in all of the rainbow colors. I think God was trying to tell me something. But I remember being told that that was something you shouldn't do. That that's something that girls do, not boys. And after the 8.30 service, I had so many people in this congregation, especially the men, tell me that they played with Barbie dolls as a girl and they got into trouble, as a boy, sorry. And they got into trouble as well. Yes, in this congregation, it would be the other way around, but we're finding ourselves in that countercultural experience. But you get the point. That many of us have been taught which leads to so many expressions in our own life of repressing ourselves and often placing ourselves higher than someone else because of what we were taught and what we were treated and how we were treated. Our scriptures remind us that we are all created in God's divine image and I'm grateful in this congregation for the ways in which we lift up female leadership, how we affirm our women and how we consistently lift them up to remind ourselves that not one of us is more superior than the other, that we are all one in Christ Jesus. Can I get an amen this morning? But I do tell you that those experiences from my youth have haunted me. And yesterday I called my sister. And I said, I need to have a conversation with you because I had a feeling that I would be talking about this this morning. And I remember vividly being taken to my sister before I went into a foster care home because my mom thought my sister could take care of me. And my sister was only 17 at the time, living in one room, and she was unable to take care of me. And she says to me yesterday that that has haunted her all the way through her life as of today. I'm grateful to a God who prompted me to make that phone call yesterday and set the record correct. That she is a divine child of God and that she has nothing to be punishing herself for and that quite frankly, perhaps that experience prepared me for who I am today. Friends, in this congregation, one of our family values 
is about equality for both women and men. And I'll say this to the men in this congregation because we have historically been a male-dominated congregation. The part of what we have done together over these many years is attempted to lift our women up and to ensure that we do what is right for the created order that God created right at the very beginning and that women leadership should be honored and valued and should never be put down in any context of the word of God. Which takes me to inclusive language. We in this congregation call God God. And we in this congregation talk about humankind rather than mankind. And that we in this congregation try to use our language in such a way that women are affirmed and included in our language. And that takes me to Advent and Christmas. And I realize that when we come to Advent services, we sometimes change the language of our carols. And I know that that upsets so many of you because I get the emails. <laughs> Friends, I want you to understand that we don't change language just for the sake of changing language and annoying you. <laughs> well, maybe just a little. <laughs> We change the language in our hymns, in our liturgy, so that we might be more inclusive, so that we might challenge the stereotypes that somehow men are better than women. We change our language so that we draw the circle wider and we ensure that God is God, not just this male God that somehow we have been taught and heard about since our very childhood, which reinforces the understanding that men are better than women. In our congregation, right this morning, we have a feminist theologian. And she continues to challenge us and to preach Bible studies and to do the work of ensuring that women's voices are not excluded from the liturgy of Cathedral of Hope United Church of Christ. And I want to say thank you this morning for reminding us constantly of that reality. It's a value we hold dear. And it's a value that we struggle with, but we must continue to be present with because we believe that God is God. And that the divine spark of God is created in each and every one of us beyond our labels, beyond our language, and beyond our patriarchy and misogyny. That we must own those things in our culture and strive to work together to reorder what God created right at the very beginning. God created and said, I create us in our image. Not just one or the other, but us. God looks at each and every one of us and sees the divine spark within us and calls it forth so that we might share our gifts with the world. Our fabulous gifts, our extravagant gifts, our masculine and feminine gifts. And let's be honest, in this congregation, sometimes that means our feminine gifts come from our men and our masculine gifts come from our women. And what a beautiful tapestry that is today. As we bring this sermon series to a close, I pray that you will share that value together as community. And that as we share that value together as community, we will lift one another up for the gifts that each and every one of us has, regardless of our gender identity, our sexual orientation, or the labels that we place upon ourselves. That we might know that God is God. And that God is just as real in Dusty as God is just as real in you. May it be so. As we strive to be that radically inclusive place which challenges the heck out of us every single Sunday. But we keep coming back. because Perhaps because we like it. But moreover, perhaps we keep coming back because we want to know this radical God that we speak of. 
a radical God that invites you and me to be at the table together. So may we hold that in common. May we live more fully into the values that we have shared. And as I close this sermon series, I pray that we don't place it on a shelf, but we might allow the Holy Spirit to do her work among us, to change us, to anoint us, and to keep becoming more Christ-like in all of our ways. I've forgiven my mom. It was a hard journey. It's still sometimes difficult to hear her side of the story. But I'm grateful to a God who loved me through that little sissy boy who loved to do crochet. But who has not taken it up again because it's sometimes painful to remember what that spoke to me. May I one day find my recovery. And perhaps there's someone in the congregation who will remind me how to do it. <laughs> God bless you, Cathedral of Hope, United Church of Christ. Let's be that value-driven place that God has called us to be. Amen. And now unto God's gracious mercy and protection, each and every one of us is given. In the blessing of God, known to us as Creator, Savior, and Holy Spirit, be with us and remain with us now and evermore. Amen. Go in peace.